All right, good evening and welcome to this evening's program. My name is Eliza Canty Jones and I work at the Oregon Historical Society. We're so pleased tonight to be able to offer this program on the history of how the political was made personal and looking in particular at anti abortion advocates uh, in the West and laying the groundwork to overturn Roe v. Wade. Just a few things as we get started here. Uh, we do want to take a moment and, and think about the land where we are here uh, in Portland, Oregon, where the Oregon Historical Society is. Uh, we are on indigenous land as we are everywhere in the Americas. And we pause to really take a moment to think about that so that folks can think about the history of settler colonialism, which is ongoing. It's a history of violence. It's a history of survivance. It's a history of sovereign nations in relationship with the United States government and with here in Oregon, the state governments. On your screen there is a map showing some of the many languages uh, that have been spoken in this region uh, for thousands of years here in the Pacific Northwest. And this month in May, we're asking folks as you uh, think about being on indigenous land and you learn the history of tribal nations uh, here in Oregon or wherever you are, uh, to pay particular attention to the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, which many uh, tribal individuals and nations are really asking folks to pay better attention to and to consider the advocacy that tribal groups are doing around this problem um, and look for places where you can speak up uh, to make a difference and learn about this issue. So thank you for taking some time to think about that. We wanna let you know about a couple of things going on at the Oregon Historical Society. We've just opened a new exhibit, A Century of Wonder, 100 Years of Oregon State Parks. We are open seven days a week. Uh, so come on in if you're here in Oregon or traveling here and check out these beautiful photographs of Oregon State Parks. And looking ahead later this month, we are gonna be opening a wonderful exhibit, a Legacy of an Enduring Spirit. These are fantastic photographs that have been taken uh, in recent years of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II at the, the camps that were across the West here uh, in the United States by the US government. So come take a look at these photographs and learn these stories. We really encourage you to do that. Uh, continuing the conversation, uh, after the conversation this evening, we encourage folks to read a, a 2015 article in the Oregon Historical Quarterly on the history of abortion trials in Portland, Oregon, uh, for about 50 years, crossing the late 19th and early 20th century. You can learn some of the history of criminalization and also uh, how people worked around that criminalization and really the, the complexities and nuances of this history. Uh, it's a really fascinating article. You can read it and over 100 other free OHQ articles online at ohs.org slash read OHQ. I'm really pleased to introduce tonight's speaker and she's gonna speak some about her research and her work and the, the conclusions that she's reached through her scholarship. Uh, and then we'll open it up to question and answer. So please do use the, the Q&A there on your Zoom screen uh, to put in questions for our speaker tonight. And we'll have a few minutes before the end of the hour for those questions. So Jennifer Holland is an associate professor of US history at the University of Oklahoma, where she specializes in histories of gender, sexuality, and race in the 20th century North American West. Her award-winning book, Tiny You, A Western History of the Anti-Abortion Movement, explains how social conservatives remade the opinions of many white religious people at the end of the 20th century, and how that cultural work in turn changed the partisan politics of much of the American West. So really looking forward to hearing this history. Thanks so much, Jen, for joining us this evening. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I am talking, I'm gonna talk tonight about my book um, and I'm gonna conclude with sort of the moment we're in. And I'm really happy to, to talk about um, really anything you all wanna talk about in terms of the history of, of this movement and, and this moment. Um, I think the more conversations we can have about this, the better in, in preparation here. So let me try, let me start my slideshow. So um, I want to start, uh, I'm just getting my, I want to start this book, uh, uh, this this talk where the book really begins, um, and that is, uh, you know, with the first with the first paragraph, and that that's about uh, Trent Franks, 
Um, Trent Franks came of political age wearing a fetus on his lapel. Um, the story of how that pin got there began in the shadow of the Cold War West in a small mining town in southwestern Colorado. Frank's 1950s hometown, Irvin, was this typical yellow cake town, uh, complete with company dominance and high levels of cancer. By the 1970s, Frank's was working in another classically Western endeavor, oil drilling. But Frank's began to chart a new career trajectory path in Utah when he took a course at the National Center for Constitutional Studies, which was formerly the Freeman Institute, which was a right-wing free market group with connections to the John Birch Society. And Frank's named this as this profound educational experience. But a short time later, he had a political epiphany and it came in the form of an anti-abortion film. He recalled, it showed a child in the throes of dying from a saline abortion. It made an indelible imprint on my heart forever. Frank soon became, according to the National Review, a pro-life warrior. One of the emblems of this war could be found on his jacket near his heart, where he wore, quote, a tie tack in the shape of the feet of a fetus as a constant reminder of his anti-abortion rights views. I began the book with Franks um, because he captured some of the things that drew me to this project. He was emblematic of a kind of West, Western politics that I thought had been largely unexplored, uh, a socially conservative politics whose main actors are religious white people. And also it drew me the, to the story of the powerful ways that anti-abortion culture reshaped many American sense of self at the end of the century. So while in the US House of Representatives, Frank suggested that African-Americans were better off under slavery than in 21st century America, because more were dying, dying of abortion, according to him, than had died under slavery. And he imagined his movement, the anti-abortion movement, as, quote, the civil rights struggle that will define our generation. Franks told the Eagle Forum in 2014, if I die and Roe versus Wade still stands, I will die of failure. And so Franks and this broader movement, you could, through Franks, you can see how the movement gave religious white conservatives a way to think of themselves as abolitionists and a part of a rights movement. And that, that sense of self that the movement created was anchored by fetal ephemera that ended up in pockets and on lapels in America's churches and in its schools. The book examines anti-abortion movements in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. The book Tiny You argues that anti-abortion activists made the political personal to many white Americans. Activists brought fetal imagery and its attendant politics into crisis pregnancy centers onto public thoroughfares um, and into schools, churches, and homes. They inserted fetal politics into profoundly intimate relationships between husband and wife, child and parent, people and their God, to name a few. Those politics invited socially conservative people to think of themselves as both abolitionists and the nation's saviors. And in the process, activists fostered and created a constituency of Americans for whom anti-abortion politics became essential to the way they thought of themselves. And when these personal politics were successful, activists helped their audience think of themselves um, and see themselves in the fetus. They, they helped individuals think of a fetus as a tiny you. Anti-abortion political activism was cultural work and its effects infiltrated seemingly apolitical spaces in Americans' lives. Activists took gory photos of aborted fetuses, fetus dolls, embalmed fetuses, videos of abortions and symbolic funerals and cemeteries into private and public spaces. And when they did that, they were waging a war for hearts and minds. The ongoing legislative battles that dominated many state governments were predicated on this more intimate activism. They were built on ecumenical organizing done in religious communities 
where the devout recited prayers against abortion, heard anti-abortion sermons, read about local political efforts, and watched anti-abortion films. They were built upon activism done in crisis pregnancy centers, which beckoned pregnant women to their doors, implicitly offering abortion referrals, but only providing anti-abortion counseling. They were built on educational activism done with young people in schools and churches and homes. And they built on family values politics that activists employed in arenas large and small, from self-help groups to state houses. And so by the 80s and 90s, they made the fetus central to how many a conservative and many American thought of being a woman, a child, a Christian, and a member of a family. So this book really explains how social conservatives remade the subjectivities of white religious people at the end of the 20th century, and how that cultural work in turn changed the partisan politics of much of the American West. At the heart of this movement, was a discourse that envisioned abortion as the perversion of modern science, a genocide akin to the Holocaust, and a product of racist or otherwise hierarchical thinking. In other words, these sort of white conservatives made the fetus into the victim of modern society and made their campaign into a justice movement. They borrowed the rhetoric of civil rights which was an ideology forged in the crucible of Southern segregation and extended in campaigns for the rights of women, Latinos, Native Americans, LGBTQ people, and many others. Anti-abortion activists put that elastic but liberal rhetoric to conservative ends. And this rhetorical turn in this movement was born at a moment of essential racial transformation in the United States. It's in the 70s that Americans begin to recast the civil rights movement as, as, as righteous, not riotous. And when they did that, Southerners uh, who resisted desegregation were really left out of history's moral arc. And so you have white conservatives having to rethink the moral and ideological basis of whiteness in the aftermath of the civil rights movement, which made the defense of segregation and white supremacy, at least at that point, publicly untenable. So through a civil rights movement for fetuses, regular white people could claim to be both the victims of modernity and also potential saviors. My book looks to Western states, not because the anti-abortion movement was born there or is bigger, stronger, more innovative, like every other region, its activists innovated some strategies, but mostly mimicked others from across the country. But this regional study of anti-abortion activists helps us see transformations in the region's politics and a national movement through new eyes. It shows why new right seeds sown decades earlier bloomed at the end of the 20th century. It was liberty, it was not liberty that motivated the Western turn to the right in the late 70s and 80s, but life. In the Mountain West and elsewhere, the anti-abortion movement remade the party of Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater, um, of course, Mr. Conservative, had not actually opposed legal abortion. His, his wife was a big supporter of Arizona Planned Parenthood, and, and Barry Goldwater himself had gotten his daughter an illegal abortion in the 1950s. But by the 1980s, Goldwater needed anti-abortion voters to keep his Senate seat. Um, and so by that point, that, that, that party had moved beyond him in many ways. When two political scientists analyzed the motivations for the Republican wave in the Mountain West in the 80s, they found that two issues compelled the region voters, distrust of the federal government and abortion. And Western historians know a lot about the former and have not spent much time on the latter. So to get at these arguments and to excavate this history, I did a lot of archival research, of course. Um, but I also had to do some moral histories with activists. Um, and these interviews ended up being the heart of the book in many ways, even as they were often hard to get. 
Um, and I really began with activists in, in crisis pregnancy centers, especially in Arizona and New Mexico. And before I move any further, you know, I, I don't use any of the graphic images of the movement, but there are parts of the rest of this uh, talk that at certain moments are a little disturbing. Um, and that's sort of just true to the movement. Um, so I give you a little warning on that. Um, so crisis pregnancy centers were and are clinic-like sort of anti-abortion alternatives to abortion clinics. Um, in these spaces, activists used deceptive practices. They were masquerading as abortion providers in order to stop abortion one woman at a time. And so through interviews with current and former crisis pregnancy center or CPC activists, I was able to sort of see the evolving politics of this movement. Um, and so the story I tell in one chapter of the book really is anchored by one particular CPC in Tucson called Reach Out. And I spoke um, among to many people related to this, but also to the one of the founders of Reach Out, Helen Cedar, you can see here the middle picture is her at a young age and uh, the other picture is her um, looking more like when I interviewed her. Um, and I also got their newsletters, which was very helpful. But Reach Out had begun in 1973 out of frustration. This handful of friends and neighbors and co-religionists had already started a different anti-abortion group a few years earlier, but they were really discouraged about their inability to stop Arizona women from accessing legal abortion. And so they looked to Birthright, um, which was this crisis pregnancy center network begun in Canada in 1968 for inspiration. So within 10 years, between 400 and 600 Birthrights were founded across the United States. But then there were a lot of others like Reach Out that were simply modeled after Birthright. But all CPCs had the same basic components. They depended on vague advertisements they refused to refer women to abortion providers, and they offered few, if any, medical services. So Helen Cedar remembered that someone early on in their group suggested they make advertisements that said, is your pregnancy a problem? Call Reach Out. And then they put them around the University of Arizona in the local newspaper, and the ad also had a, a hotline that women could call. Cedar recalled they didn't know uh, where we were coming from. Most of the girls called because they thought we, we were gonna give them abortions. She added, everybody that called me wanted an abortion, everybody. In 1975, uh, Reach Out reported handling about 20 to 30 calls a month while Birthright of Tucson was getting about 80 to 100 calls a month. And once a CPC activist convinced uh, a woman to come to the center to get a free pregnancy test to confirm that she was in fact pregnant and then they would continue to talk to her. Another of their deceptive practices, before I move on, I'll show you, this is from uh, a crisis pregnancy center in uh, Tempe, Arizona. Um, this is the abortion provider, Family Planning Institute. And this is the, uh, the crisis pregnancy center. So you can see how the names are supposed to look similar. There's, they, they, one of the tactics was to be right nearby so people would be going to an abortion provider and then accidentally end up in a crisis pregnancy center. So when women entered a CPC, activists first offered them the free pregnancy test, but also they tried to offer this personal relationship with an activist. Lori Futch, who is a birthright activist in Phoenix, emphasized, we just offered friendship to gals who were in a crisis. We always tried to have a homey place. And Futch and others who did this work said they achieved a, a kind of kitchen table feeling precisely because they were not professionals. Activists were just homemakers, wives, mothers, daughters, friends. When National Right to Life News profiled birthright in 1976, the writer suggested that women came to CPCs precisely because counselors were, quote, just women. And this is from uh, National Right to Life News. Why should she be afraid to talk to Jane Doe Birthright? This is not someone she has to impress. This is not a brilliant professional. This is not a meaningful person, just a housewife. An anti-abortion counselor was simply a woman who listened to another woman's problems and then, as National Right to Life News put it, 
from the well of her womanhood experience, she responds. And so in these spaces, activists tried to play the role of mothers or friends to women seeking abortions. And truly these were women only spaces and are still. Um, this was not because the men of the movement disregarded abortion seekers, but because anti-abortion activists believed that no man could speak from the well of his womanhood experience. And so men really had only subsidiary and peripheral roles um, in regards to CBCs. And so the women who staffed this movement, these white, religious, largely middle-class women, they had special roles in these spaces. They had the experiential authority to speak to other women and this claimed moral authority to intervene in familial issues. Um, so they found this home here and there these white conservative women sought to quote unquote mother, poor women, young women, black and ethnic Mexican pregnant women and tried to convince them in turn to become mothers. So these activists uh, overtly rejected this gendered alienation that came with professionals, but they did employ uh, the authority of medicine to make their appeals. So free pregnancy tests were the hook to get women in the door. And then activists played the part of healthcare providers when they took a woman's urine sample. And the huge majority of CPC volunteers had no uh, medical training whatsoever. But the CPC quote unquote counseling was focused on fetal development with counselors explaining what a fetus looked like, showing models or movies, discussing heartbeats, fingers and toes and brain waves and fetal pain. At first, they really relied on scientifically legitimate models and movies made by non-activists, and then they would do a voiceover or just in the context of the clinic, they would sort of take on new meaning. But also, um, CPC counselors made amorphous scientific claims um, and developed new, new tools as time went on. If counselors used similar language to the pamphlets they pamped out, passed out, they began sentence it, phrase, they began with phrases like, in the past few years, research by important medical doctors has proved, and then they'd end sentences with phrases like, life begins at conception, or abortion could permanently damage your female organs. Um, then with fetal models and this endorsement of distant, faceless doctors, they made the argument that abortion was murder. Now in the 80s and 90s, CPCs became even more medical, sometimes just in performance and sometimes in practice. Some CPCs simply added, had their activists wear lab coats. Um, other CPCs began offering STD tests or ultrasounds to draw in women. And one CPC director explained why. If you can get a lady into an ultrasound room, then 90% will carry that baby to term. So in these spaces, activists could stand in for the doctors who they believed had failed these unfortunately pregnant women. And so in CPCs, activists felt like it was their job, these white conservative women's job to reconnect lost women to, to the supposed biological truth of fetal life. Now, not all were convinced, of course. Some days, Helen Sater recalled, I wasn't sharp enough to save babies. There were days they decided, no, they were gonna have the abortion and that tore you up. Went home and said, where were you, good Lord? What could I have said? What could I have done? In fact, by reach, out, reach Out's own accounting, in 1985, fewer than 10% of clients who came in for pregnancy tests told Reach Out volunteers they had changed their minds about abortion. So many left unconvinced, but many others left traumatized. They said that they were drawn in by these deceptive practices, and then they were forced to hear these uh, political pitches or watch anti-abortion films. And so CPCs in these states and elsewhere really faced a lot of legal trouble at the end of the 20th century because of their deceptive practices. So any woman could find herself at a CPC, but the, the centers usually dealt with women who didn't have independent access to healthcare either because they were too young or too poor. And so white CPC activists really thought of themselves as remaking poor women and young women and women of color. And they thought that that process, early on they thought the process wouldn't be too difficult. But in practice, those kitchen table conversations were often not sufficient. 
um, that they offered minor material aid or familial support uh, to try to get a woman to change her mind. Um, but the women that, they, that came to them often refused to conform to their, their anti-abortion ima uh, imaginings. And so in the 80s and 90s, these activists wrestled with questions about their work. Was this material aid they offered enough to reform these women? And were CPCs truly stopping abortions? These questions plagued activists and led them to have doubts about their practices. So since their inception, CPCs had featured this a donations closet with items gathered to help support women who decided to carry their pregnancies to term. And gradually these services had expanded. And so centers offered clothing, diapers, and furniture to, to poor mothers. But by the mid eighties, half of Reach Out's clients came for the donations closet alone, not because they needed a pregnancy test or because they were considering abortion. And so managing donations for women who were not even considering abortion became the majority in that decade of the center's work. So activists began to wonder if women were abusing their services. A few, they thought, took more than their fair, sh fair share. Mary LeCue in Albuquerque recalled, I mean, everything in the closets was donated, 100% donated. And you'd have one client, client come in and wipe the place out. Another CPC activist remembered thinking of clients, she just uses us to get free stuff. Activists who relied upon deception fretted that some pregnant women were abusing their trust. But in some ways, CPC activists were right to question if the material support they were offering was truly challenging legalized abortion. And so activists came up with new strategies in the 1980s. And these strategies they hoped would truly transform women and connect them more fully to fetal life. So the CPCs kept hold of the idea that fetuses were victims of abortion, um, but they developed this new vision of women's relationship to abortion. They tried to change women's relationship to abortion and help them see themselves differently. So interviewees told me that in the 80s, these, these centers began to move away from a narrow goal of quote unquote saving babies to saving both baby and pregnant woman. So one way they changed the donation system was they changed the donation system. So rather than just allowing a woman to take whatever she deemed necessary, Many CPCs in the 80s began insisting that women earn donated items. So Dinah Monahan of Sholo, Arizona, um, often gets credit with developing this program. So in the early 80s, Monahan and her parents ran a handful of crisis pregnancy centers in rural Eastern Arizona. They provided typical CPC fare. In those early years, Monahan, like so many CPC activists, felt like this is her quote, we were simply accommodating our clients, not transforming them. So from this experience, she created a program called Earn While You Learn, where women earned, quote, mommy dollars by attending classes. So the classes range from sort of prenatal and newborn care into sort of what they call the developing pre-born and sexual integrity. And so once you took those classes, those dollars you got in return could be used to purchase those donated items from the, what they call now the baby boutique. So she implemented these in her crisis pregnancy centers, which included the only center in the country on an Indian reservation, and then marketed it to CPCs across the nation. And so over the years, her program turned into a 45 lesson course in nine modules. Um, in both English and Spanish. So through these programs, activists worked to change women's worldview, not just their minds. Albuquerque activist Laura Bowman said the program taught women, quote, how to be better women and better mothers and better wives. So the other way that CPCs changed in the 1980s and 1990s was in their embrace and implementation of what they called post-abortion counseling. So in 81, Vincent Rue, who was a psychotherapist, um, uh, 
anti-abortion psychotherapist. He coined this term post-abortion syndrome during a congression, congressional hearing. This is a cyto, pseudoscientific diagnosis where activists argued abortion led to trauma and mental repercussions, including depression, attempted suicide, substance abuse, and violence. And so in this political diagnosis, activists imagined a new kind of victimhood for women who had abortions, one where their unknowing perpetration of a moral crime led to long-term psychological damage. Before I move on, I really wanna say very precisely that this diagnosis is not supported by the American Medical Association or the American Psychiatric Association. Um, it, for example, in 1989, Nancy Adler of the APA told a magazine, this is her quote, that despite the millions of women who've undergone the procedure since the landmark ruling Roe versus Wade, there's been no accompanying rise in mental illness. And these, these groups put out study after study looking into uh, whether the abortion is a commonly trauma-inducing event and over and over again, they say no, but that was no matter. For the movement um, with the creation of post-abortion syndrome, activists made abortion into this critical psychological event in the life of American women, not just a medical reality for the life of fetuses. And so CPCs really expand their mission um, along these lines. So they begin, begin to work on educational and therapeutic levels to educate American women about the social system they say led, led to abortion and also the trauma it supposedly caused. And so CPCs in the four corner states organized post-abortion groups and uh, taught local religious leaders how to do what they called post-abortion counseling with members of their congregations. So for example, by the mid 2000s, the Catholic church ran some kind of post-abortion counseling in at least 165 of its dioceses. So post-abortion counselors, what this counseling looked like was that they probed into the personal trauma, depression, guilt, and melancholy in a person's life and gave it a social explanation. They gave it an origin point and that origin point was always abortion. And women in these counseling sessions were not allowed to direct their own sessions, but were instead led to inevitable conclusions. So one counselor explained, we didn't get into what their mother did to them or if they were bipolar. We really stayed focused on the abortion issue. So activists thought that women were plagued by repression. And so in order to get beyond denial and repression, Anti-abortion counseling demanded that a woman re-experience her abortion. She had to detail physical and emotional experiences of that day. And then through the power of suggestion, counselors helped women find answers to questions they might have asked, um, or at least they ask now. So the manuals ask the woman to consider, does a fetus experience pain or distress? And the manuals responded, the woman becomes acutely aware of her perceptions of the fetus as an unborn child and that she re-experiences a sensation of death, which was one of many similar questions. And then once all these questions were explored, the counselor could quote unquote, organize the facts. And then the reorganization would necessarily make the connection between a woman's insecurities, her sadness and her abortion. Breaking through repression and denial was accomplished more easily also, they said, in a group setting, according to the manuals, because one woman's awakening could cause a collective emotional landslide. Manuals called this tailgating. And one manual offered this as an example. In one group session, a woman who was ambivalent about conceiving again was given a doll and asked to, quote, externalize her feelings about her aborted child. Once the counselor asked the woman to connect her aborted fetus to her quote unquote aborted child through the body of the doll, she expressed deep feelings of remorse and sorrow. And then the other women in the group mirrored this transformation. And this is a quote from the manual, moving from an intellectual exploration of their abortions to a much deeper awareness of the depth of denial and repression of their feelings. So they said, this is possible through individual counselor counseling but it was harder without the emotional responses of the group. So to make peace with this person's supposed transgression, counselors suggested that the woman engage in role-playing to repair her damaged relationships. 
First and foremost, she was asked to repair uh, her relationship with God and with her aborted fetus. And the council was never supposed to explicitly speak for God in the role play, but the counselor did tell a woman what God wanted to hear. The manuals offered this template. Heidi, can you tell God exactly who it is you killed? And it went on from there. I wanna say this counseling was done in the name of caring for women. Not all CPC activists were happy with this new focus on women's psyche. Some activists gradually pulled away. Helen Sater was one of those. She went on to be a part of the rescue movement and she recalled her reasons for departure from Reach Out. It was just that when they got away from the initial thing about saving the babies that I thought I was tired. Many of those who stayed though, believed they had finally figured out a program that would quote unquote, save both. And in fact, women activists continued to flock to CPCs in the 80s and 90s. And for converts uh, to this anti-abortion vision, activists changed what it meant to be a woman. They made this supposedly intrinsic knowledge of fetal life central to the female experience. And once that link was made, CPC activists had the potential to not only stop abortions, but make activists. One of the central goals of this activism was to create new activists and they called them quote unquote, post-abortive women. A woman's abortion placed her supposedly on the same level with those considering abortion and her trauma was proof that abortion was an abomination. And activists had this audience of, uh, of a whole host of women, including a good number of women of color, but almost all of the women who came to think of themselves as post-abortive activists who, who joined up when invited, almost all of them were white. One such, oh, pardon, let's see. Um, one such activist was Pam Lobb, who told her abortion story to the Health Committee of the Arizona House in 1985. Lobb and others told a similar story that their abortion provider had failed to discuss fetal development. He had ignored the profound physical and emotional damage of abortion and patients suffered as a result. Lobb spoke that day in favor of an anti-abortion bill and said the bill would quote unquote, protect women. Such women-centered anti-abortion narratives helped pass the bill in Arizona that day and many others across, uh, across the country in the next three decades. Lobb also spoke to a legislature primed to pass those bills. There was a handful of virulent anti-abortion representatives who had recently joined the Arizona legislature, including Trent Franks. And so the movement had helped elect a willing audience for Lobb's appeals. So this rhetoric helped give, help legislators like this give crisis pregnancy centers an incredible amount of state and federal dollars in the 21st century. And CBC activists over these years convinced many Americans and even some Supreme Court justices that it was they, not abortion providers or feminists who truly protected women. This work affected all parts of the United States but had a more profound impact on the American West, especially the interior West. Um, CPCs moved out of urban areas into rural areas, and this was at a moment when abortion was virtually unobtainable outside of urban areas. And of course, those urban area abortion clinics shrunk as years went on. Um, and this really left rural Westerners, especially those in remote areas with incredibly long drives to get reproductive health care. And this would become only more so as time went on. So for example, in 2014, 78% of Colorado count counties and 97% of Utah counties had no abortion provider, but the huge majority of these counties had a crisis pregnancy centers. And here's a picture from Texas, which is very outdated now, especially in terms of abortion providers um, from 2015. But in rural areas in particular, CPC activists could become friend, mother, doctor, and political mentor to those who had no other options. So Abortion, more so than any other issue, was social conservatism's political buoy. When other issues died, either at the polls or in the courts or in the court of public opinion, social conservatives could always cling to legal abortion as the unwavering evidence of moral decay. And this issue continued to galvanize the broader movement, drawing in new, younger activists 
and generating new political strategies. And in a pinch, a conservative politician could always use the dog whistle of life to clarify a basic moral difference between the two major parties. And for a good number of conservatives, there was no weakness, political, familial, or even sexual, that could outweigh the importance of a candidate's anti-abortion stance. And in the 21st century, we see uh, the, the real effects of this on the Republican Party, because by that point, social conservatives had refused to support Republican candidates who said the right things during elections, but wouldn't follow through with laws, limiting abortion, or with following through uh, anti-abortion Supreme Court justices. We're all faced with the world that these this with faced with the world that these activists have made. My state, Oklahoma, now functionally has no legal abortion. Texans and Oklahomans are going to nearby states for their abortions, but the geography of the, that medical migration will change drastically in the next couple months. As we know, Roe versus Wade will likely be overturned this month or next. And then over half of the US states will immediately or very quickly outlaw abortion. But this won't be the end of the anti-abortion movement because the goal is not to send the issue back to the states, but to outlaw abortion across the United States. So they'll either try to get some kind of uh, federal law, or of course, they'll come back to the court and ask them to consider fetuses as citizens under the 14th Amendment. I really didn't write this book thinking Roe was at the end of its life. But as that time approaches, we must all look back at the last 50 years with new eyes. It's clear that with Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965, which articulated a constitutionally protect, protected right to privacy, that this was a moment when sexual rights were beginning to be protected by the US Constitution in earnest. But this now we can see was not the beginning of the future, but the beginning of a moment in time and that time is almost over. In the next decade, women, pregnant people, and sexual minorities will surely find themselves with less rights, not more. And those rights, if we're lucky, will depend on what state you live in. So we must look back at the last 50 years and ask who and how has this moment ended? Who has so decisively changed the tides of history? And I think some of the answers are in this book, and they surely are with this movement. Thank you. Jen, thank you so much. That was really um, eye-opening for me in a lot of ways, and, and maybe you know for some other folks as well. I want to remind folks that if you have questions, you can use the, the Q&A box or the chat box and bring those up. You know, One of the questions that's on my mind as I was listening to you and you know, you're you're helping me think about how this really was truly a grassroots grassroots movement has been. You know, looking in 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 recent times, it's easy to see a handful of very powerful men really making these decisions. But in fact, you know, you're talking about these are really largely women who made this happen on the grassroots. And one of the things that you talked about was how these are, <coughs> excuse me, largely if not all white women. And that this is somehow connected to their identity as as white women or as white Christian women. Can you talk a little bit more about that sort of identity piece for these women who really felt, you know, it seems like felt really called to go and and do this work and probably even believed all of the things that they were saying, yes. right? So can you talk some about, you know, that identity and those beliefs and how that all fit together? Yeah. So the activists, it's really the early ones who aren't convinced by this process of politicization they are compelled by this idea that um, women are different and special and the capacity to reproduce is, is central to that. But it's not just the capacity, it's that this like mother role is central to what it means to be, not only to be a woman, but what makes it special and different. And that if you, if you sort of release that, right, you're, you're releasing something that is core to them as women and, and core to something that is both natural and also something God or you know God ordained specialness, um, and that really and also they're force motivated by their faiths, um, that have told that have also told them that this is this is this very special role that God's asked them to play, and their rhetoric isn't religious often, 
Um, you know, it is often internally more so, but public facing, it's not, but they are all religious people. Um, and so I think that their religious spaces have invited this kind of idea around, about, you know, sort of pedestals um, and, and reproduction being really central to the reason why women sit on a pedestal. And they think that feminism has like undercut that and especially legal abortion, right? That men are no longer, that illegal abortion allows men to be irresponsible. They fundamentally think that contraception and abortion mean that men can sort of have sex with you and leave, right? That, that it's, it's, the, it's the threat of pregnancy that forces men to do right by women and take care of them. Um, and so they have the, all these imaginings of women being abandoned, you know, and women sort of being cast, used and cast aside um, because, they, because they can have sex consequence free. You know, that's interesting. I'm thinking about some of the rhetoric, you know, just heard in the past couple of weeks from, you know, anti-abortion leaders today and some of what they're talking about, um, these ideas that women are coerced into yeah. abortions. And so really this idea that by outlawing abortion, you, you save women yeah. from this other kind of oppression. So you're really helping us understand that from this sort of yeah. post-abortion counseling, so to speak. Right. Um, well, and this is one of the conundrums of the movement because they have, especially since the 80s on, or before that, they just sort of tried to hide women. They're like, we don't know what to do with them because it's a confounding problem, right? That like, if abortion is murder, who are the murderers? And right. abortion providers are always the core answer, but that doesn't make a lot of, like there is a missing link there. Mm -hmm. And so for a long time, they just tried to ignore them. But in the 80s and 90s, they came up with this other idea. Um, but they've really convinced themselves that women are going to be better off without access to legal abortion. You know, that everyone's going to be better off. You'll just make it work. And we are coming up on a moment where we are all going to be faced with watching the outcomes of that. Well, I'm just thinking about what I understand from the Texas law, that SB8 law, and then also, again, you know, some of this rhetoric around we're not punishing women, yeah. right? And that law everyone but the person who has an abortion is a right. person who can be, you, you yeah. know, who can be brought up and, you know, get the bounty on this. Yeah. Thing, right? And so. there, that's in a lot of laws, but it's not in all of them. Right. Um, and, and the question is like, it's, it's logical that those are going to, especially because now um, with the abortion pill, like they're often, there'll be, might be a pharmacist, but there might not be an abortion provider. Right. Um, and so who, who is it then, if not the person seeking the abortion pill who will be prosecuted in these red states? Um, and so, yeah, they say they are, they are still very convinced and there isn't a lot of laws that, that women aren't gonna be prosecuted, but it already is slipping out of, of some of these laws. Oh, that's interesting. There's a, a question from an audience member about who are the religious leaders who were inspiring uh, these women, these activists who you were talking about? Yeah. So um, in some ways, especially early on, I, I think religious leaders do play a really important role. Um, they do. And I also think it's not top down in the way you might imagine. I mean, especially in the early years, even the Catholics, really, the, the story, like, of course, the church was opposed to abortion, and they had created all this infrastructure to do this. But then, especially in this really early 70s moment, they sort of hesitate, because they're worried about losing their tax exempt status. Um, and so they're not quite sure what the church itself can do. And so in that early moment, they have activists who've been primed by their church to do this work, pushing their hierarchies to commit. And so the church, you know, the Catholic church by the mid seventies does uh, in more ways, but a similar thing you can see with evangelicals that it's individual activists who are pushing their denominations first, of course, Eventually, into the 80s, you, you, of course, you have the rise of incredibly important um, religious leaders, um, or even someone who's not actually a minister at all, but someone like James Dobson, a focus on the family. You know, he's not, but he sort of operates at that. And he, so he both um, rises on the back of some, some of this grassroots movement, but also he continues to disseminate um, these politics through this expansive empire, media empire, right? Um, so, it's not so much, I think, top down and within these religious communities, it's always diverse, right? There's always Catholics who are not on board. 
and evangelicals and certainly a whole host of other religious people. Um, but, you know, Catholics, they really are often pressing their priests, but then there also are priests who if you get into a church where, you, you know, your, pre your priest is really on board, you are going to be hearing anti-abortion sermons more frequently, right? Um, but so I don't, it's not, I, I would say that more so we have a grassroots that, that is pushing at first and then works in tandem with people who in some ways rise on their backs um, to, to prominence often. That's so interesting. I'm just thinking about the, um, <clears throat> you know, in an earlier generation, maybe by a couple generations, the women who were anti-woman suffragists and how they're sort of antecedents to these women who are, who are trying to protect a, a yeah. specialist in some way. There's yeah. a Conservative women sort of, they, there's a certain strand that links them all, yeah, especially about the 20th century. Yeah. Um, you talked some about how these um, crisis pregnancy centers, the women were, you know, donning lab coats or using medical equipment. Were any arrested or charged for impersonating medical professionals, and what would what happened there? Um, yeah, so sometimes they were they were they weren't prosecuted for impersonating, though there were these uh, congressional hearings. Um, actually, I think it was an Oregon representative who like led the charge in investigating these. I can't remember his name, but. Um, so there was these congressional hearings and then there were there were cases, especially um, not for impersonation per se, but uh, the the one that I was talking about in Tempe, they are the one they donned the, the picture where they were in the same the same uh, complex. They not only wore lab coats, but they went into the parking lot in the lab coats and they would, they, you know, <laughs> they would actually be like, hey, are you looking for this place? And then they would lead you in. And they were prosecuted, not for impersonation, but because um, once they got one of those people in there, they, they put her in a room with this graphic film and the door jammed. And so she couldn't, she like physically couldn't leave. And, uh, and they, they prosecuted them for, for um, imprisonment. Um, so there are things like that, that, um, that they do get bound up in the law and there's a whole host of states that try to pass laws trying to get them to have to advertise more honestly um so there is a they really do get enmeshed in a whole host of of um legal trouble but, but it doesn't matter because it's not enough legal trouble and then you have states and, and the federal government eventually funneling money into them um so like for example my state you know they sell a uh, license plate, an anti-abortion license plate, every single dollar from those funnels into crisis pregnancy centers. You know, that I was just thinking, well, where does this money come from? It must come through the churches, but it also comes from taxpayers who are funding. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, and and federal tax money is not able to fund abortions right. because of the Hyde Amendment, right? Wow. Right. Um, Speaking yeah. of money, uh, there's a, a question from an audience member about speculating if you can or talk about the, the political overlap between people who are anti-abortion and also the ones who oppose the social safety nets. I think I'm, I'm probably not alone in being really taken aback and, and you know fascinated by the women who are going in to use the closets and use the donated yeah. items for their babies mm -hmm. um, and that being just sort of a fascinating part of this history. So where's the, the overlap or not? with yeah. and opposing social safety nets? Well, so I think the thing that's very interesting, so a lot early on, a lot of these activists, not all, like I would say a majority, but not all of them, right, are Democrats um, because Catholics were Democrats in the 60s. And so they imagined themselves as sort of more, you know, okay with a big state. And you can imagine social conservatives in general are are different that way. They are comfortable with a strong state as long as the state is, is supporting their vision of morality. Um, and so, uh, but, but that the, the movement can make coalition with small government conservatives in some ways and Roe Ro sort of allows that easier because Roe becomes this, um, this sort of punching bag that, that activists can be like, this is evidence of, a, of not only an oppressive federal government, but a genocidal one. So they can sort of, they can build common cause with small government conservatives. Um, and, and, and in some ways, other scholars have argued that they themselves become more conservative and more committed to small government 
as time goes on um, through those coalitions. But I'll say that um, at this moment, I, you know, there are a lot of young, especially young activists who sort of really imagine themselves in this progressive narrative about being a part of a justice movement. And there are a lot of young activists right now who think that when abortion's banned, these states are going to create, you know, social safety nets for, for these people who now have bigger families than they want. And I, I will be shocked if that occurs as someone who lives in one of those states who's the, the legislature is deeply committed to, to not funding anything, you know, and really anti-abortion politics has have been very cheap um, for conservatives so far, besides like some of these legal cases, passing a law that then gets stayed, it, it, you know, just is pretty cheap, but, but it's gonna, these contradictions between social conservatives and small government conservatives are going to be perhaps um, a tension point, I think in, in these deep red states, um, if Roe is overturned. You know, just thinking about those potential tension points and in the, the draft decision that was leaked, you know, from, from, you know, just the bits that I've read. And one of the things that, that Justice Alito had written was like, yes, this argument could be used to overturn, you know, all of these other rights, yeah. but this is different because it's about life. Right. And so, um, which, you know, we'll see. But I think um, what I'm interested in is the activists who you studied and the activists who you interviewed did they see this really significant difference between, you know, are they thinking about the 14th Amendment and the protection of these rights or, or state rights? Yeah. I mean, as you said, it's the national abortion ban will be proposed. Where are they seeing any connections in this sort of yeah. legal strategy or not? Well, so the, the movements themselves have really, I mean, until fairly recently when I think they've gotten a little um, thrilled about the possibilities of what they could do, um, they were really, really focused on, this is our only issue, they only added euthanasia, like, and they really didn't do much on that. Like that was sort of like, they were like, this is our only issue. And they even tried to sort of not talk about birth control because they knew that was so popular that they couldn't bring that in as an issue either. But um, Texas Right to Life in their amicus brief for this court decision, very clearly linked um, Roe with, um, with, you know, sort of the, Lawrence v. Texas, which um, outlawed sodomy laws, and also Obergefell, and called them all um, lawless. And so I think that that's sort of a showing of the hand, that even though the movement, for I think political reasons, has been very focused on one issue, that that once o Roe is overturned, um, there is going to be, and, and especially once there is no more constitutionally protected right to privacy, those are all going to be opened up in some way. They could be opened up by anybody, right? And really, while Alito made that claim that they're different, his broader logic is actually much more concerning for, for queer rights, even than abortion rights. And, you know, he says, like, there isn't a, a rootedness in, in the American past of legal abortion, but there's 100 years where there's legal abortion in the United States. And we cannot say that about queer rights, right? Queer rights has definitely little. Um, if we're look, if we need rights to be existing in the 18th and 19th century, queer people are not going to have them, you know. Um, and so I think that's the broader concern. Lido, yeah, you're right, you said this is different, but the broader logic, I think, is is really concerning. Yeah, thank you for that. There's, we have one last question from an audience member um, who's interested in these connections between people who are also opposing uh, contraception and then wanting to know how does IVF feel, fit into the anti-abortion worldview. And I, it's an yeah. interesting difference, right? Because abort, you can see the contraception as that denial of a woman's, you know, um, God-given purpose. Yeah. But then IVF is, is a little bit different. So can you speak some about that in the movement? Yeah. Well, contraception, they really didn't want to deal with, as I said, because it was so popular. But um, but I had an activist once, uh, actually it was a crisis pregnancy center activist who, who, you know, I was sort of finishing the interview and she's like, don't you want to ask me about contraception? And I was like, sure. So what do you have to say about contraception? And she was like, we have no stance. And I was like, oh, um, and I think, I think she said, you know, I, basically she was saying that like they were opposed, but the organizations had no stance because they really didn't want to 
get involved in that per se. But of course, IUDs, um, the movement really counts as abortifacients um, because the movement considers pregnancy to begin not at implantation, but at fertilization and many IUDs prevent implantation. And so that they do not classify as contraception, they classify as, um, as abortion. And, um, and so, so I think that that is, uh, that's sort of where the movement is. They basically didn't want to say anything, but I think it's, you know, they also are concerned about it. The problem is with IVF is that IVF is really only possible with abortion, you mm -hmm. know, because, and, and it only, it, it only comes into being after row that you have, you know, a number of fertilized eggs and, and if you, you can't implant 10, if, if you can't, you can't, that's not possible, right? Um, and, and so they, I don't, I've not read anything about the movement taking a stance about IVF, but, you know, we know that they do about testing on fetal cells mm -hmm. quite a bit. And I think that that falls and they were obsessed with that. Um, and so I think both of those things are gonna, are really going to, also be illegal. It's impossible for them not to be legal in states where abortion is illegal. Thank you very much for taking the time on short notice late at night on the East Coast to come and give us this really um, powerful context for understanding where we are today and, and really important parts of how we got here. Just can't thank you enough for this. The book again is Tiny You available in libraries and bookstores everywhere, I assume, uh, winner of many prestigious awards. So we really appreciate your time here tonight, Jen. Uh, Dr. Holland, we appreciate all of you audience members for joining us this evening and listening along and asking good questions. We'll put a, an edited version of this up on our website, make it look professional, and it'll be up in about two weeks. Uh, so take a look for it there and you can share it out with friends and watch it again. And um, thanks everyone uh, for paying attention and being here with us this evening and have a good night. Thank you. Oh, you bet.